welcome to This Is Horror, a podcast for readers, writers, and creators. I'm your host, Michael David Wilson, and today we are going to be chatting with Max Booth III and Laurie Michelle, the publishers and editors of Perpetual Motion Machine Publishing, about their latest anthology, Lost Films. Now, this is the third time that we've had Max Booth on the podcast. It is always a pleasure. It is always highly entertaining. There are a lot of laugh out loud moments, and this time was certainly no exception. So, I think you're going to get a lot out of it. I think it's going to be informative, but I hope it's also going to be pretty damn funny as well. Now, before we get into that conversation with myself and Bob Pastorella, it is time to have a quick word from our sponsor. Do you like Stephen King? Do you like podcasts of Stephen King? Do you like spooky magazines? Good news. Now you can have a Stephen King podcast, Castle Rock Radio. And you can have a spooky magazine, Dark Moon Digest. All you have to do, go to www.patreon.com slash PMM Publishing. Have a scary day. Okay, and I'm back. Now, before we get into the interview, here are the bios of Laurie Michelle and Max Booth III. Laurie Michelle is the co-owner of Perpetual Motion Machine Publishing, as well as editor-in-chief of both Dark Moon Digest and the now-defunct Dark Eclipse. She is the author of Dual Harvest and the editor of Bleed, an anthology to benefit the National Children's Cancer Society. Her stories have appeared in several anthologies, including the 2012 Bram Stoker finalist Slices of Flesh, and the 2014 Bram Stoker finalist, Carlia Noose, which I'm probably pronouncing incorrectly. She can be found at www.theauthorsalley.com. Her favourite film is Places in the Heart. On to Max Booth III. He is the editor-in-chief of Perpetual Motion Machine, the managing director of Dark Moon Digest, a columnist for Lit Reactor, and the author of numerous novels, including The Nightly Disease, which some critics have labelled as the holy bible for the customer service industry. His next novel, Carnivorous Lunar Activities, which we talk about in this conversation, is forthcoming through Fangoria's new line of horror paperbacks. Follow him on Twitter at Give Me Your Teeth. And his favourite film is Zodiac. And what a fantastic film it is. Okay, with that said, here we go. It is Max Booth III and Laurie Michelle on This Is Horror. And now for a horror. Interview. Max and Laurie, welcome to the This Is Horror podcast. Hello. Hi. How's it going? Yeah. All good. Thank you. Looking forward to chatting with you about Lost Films, your latest anthology. Thank you. And so, I mean, on that note, why don't we just kick off with the theme why the Lost Films theme? Oh, the, well, I mean, in the past, we did a book called Lost Signals, which had an audio theme to it, like spooky signals that happened to be lost. Um, so it seemed like a good idea to follow that up with films, the visual component. And that was the main inspiration. Uh, I think somebody made a joke at something about Lost Signals when it first came out, and you're like, ha-ha, Lost Films, and they're like, holy shit, we've got to do Lost Films next. Yeah, probably. Mm-hmm. Most things begin as jokes with us. Yeah. Right, <laughs> right. Like this whole, noticed, that's but... like the company altogether. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> uh, a lot of, like, 
media, like fiction, movies, and books that already exist, like really inspired it. Like um, Experimental Film by Gemma Fields, uh, Cigarette Bones by John Carpenter. That there was a movie in that anthology show. What the fuck was it called? I think Masters that's of Masters of Horror. Horror. Yeah, yeah. It's one of my favorite little films that they did. That was a great one. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, I mean, I just feel so much potential with the idea of a lost film. Just not, I mean, the theme we put out, it was, it had a lot to do. Like, yeah, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> Is that going to, that's going to be the next anthology, Lost, lost Thoughts. Lost Thoughts. Lost thoughts. Yeah. yeah. Lost Thoughts, Lost. Lost Wallets, <laughs> Lost Causes. I mean, we have a long way to go. Yeah. I mean, like, I don't know. What do you think? What do I think about what? I about, forgot what you were talking uh, about. About what inspired the anthology. Well, I mean, Lost Signals was kind of cool because it was. It was like, okay, well, what if this transmission gets lost? And it just it seemed like a natural thing to go from hearing to sight. Yeah. Because that is the next sense. Sense that. So would from, make from then we would go on to lost smells, lost smells, lost taste. Yeah, <laughs> lost seeing dead people. There you That's go. a sense, I believe. Lost touches. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what do you think about this, Michael and Bob? <laughs> Have we answered the question thoroughly? Yeah, yeah but I also <laughs> think that there's probably a connection to you know some other things that not necessarily lost, but. Kind of like almost forbidden, you know, like video drone things like that. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Now, like when we title this book "Lost Films," we're not promise promising every silly is going to be about an actual film that's been lost. It's just like a vague term that I've used to describe just disturbing uh, fiction related to film or visual. any type of visual medium. Like we have stories about webcam in this webcams in this right and um also films films we have <laughs> yeah video cassettes yeah video yeah vhs's yeah Ooh. does vhs even exist anymore yeah that's it can you go out and get a vhs tape yeah i'm not talking about from the flea market max do you guys know what flea milk it's all in the the uk michael yeah we do what do you call them what do we call them um, yeah, well, hmm. a name like the slug milk. I don't know what you guys have. <laughs> I'm kind of blanking. I think if you said a flea market, I would I would say a flea market too. Yeah. What do well, you, it's like in California, we don't call them flea markets. We call them swap meets. We definitely oh. don't call them that. Yeah, well, it's just a... That means something completely different. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, that, you know, that, you know yeah. Out there, so. What does it mean in England? I guess, like, yeah. I guess, like, we might... If we called it a car boot sale, I guess is that the same thing, or is that like a slightly different variant at a flea market? I can't believe we're now defining flea markets. That's that's one of the biggest differences between these countries. In the U.S., all vehicles do not have footbill. <laughs> they just no shoes of any kind. I don't know what you're talking about, Max. <laughs> Do you want to explain this? Because I said car joke? boot when we call it a trunk. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. Yeah, the U.S. audience will love that joke. <laughs> you have that little groan. Yeah. Or we'll cut it. Or, yeah, which is more than likely. Yeah, like, since becoming a father, like, I'm far more sleep deprived and a little bit slower <laughs> to, to react. To it doesn't go away. <laughs> yeah, but I, I guess the... Yeah, the jump from boot to trunk to feet. Yeah, well, I guess it wasn't that fucking radical. <laughs> I mean, being a dad, I thought you'd be accustomed to dad jokes by now, but you seem to be losing your ability to grasp them. I think he's losing his ability to reality. It just happens when you have a child. I think I used to be more into dad jokes, ironically, before becoming a dad, because this is something that not a lot of people who listen to this as horror know, but at one time I decided dadsjokes.com, that has got to be a moneymaker. 
So then I bought, you... the, I, bu I bought the domain. I owned it for about two years and then was like, yeah, I'm not, <laughs> not going to make dadsjokes.com. That's not where I see myself going. So hopefully <laughs> Thomas jokes. Joyce will now, you know, pick it up. What was that, he's, Max? He's great at those. I said the podcast should have been called This Is D Dad Jokes. It should have, yeah. That, so was really... it a UK address he bought? Well, I mean, Max, at the time, I thought, this is such a fucking good idea. I better buy .com and .co.uk because this shit can be getting very big. So I got both of them covered. But then, you know, two years later was like, I'm, I'm not going to spend my time doing dad's jokes. That's not what I was born to do. <laughs> yeah, you probably, you probably, the only time after the first year that you were reminded that you even had these domains is when GoDaddy sent you an email reminding you that they were going to charge you for these domains that you weren't using. Oh, I mean, like, I think I was aware of it quite a lot because, you know, I'd, I'd remind my wife and she'd just like look at me disgusted, which, yeah, it was like a fair and reasonable way to look at me generally, but uh, even more so with that domain. Well, uh, I think the strangest domain I ever bought was ChainsawAnima.com. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you actually ever buy that domain, yeah. or was it just your WordPress site? Oh, maybe it was. I, no, I think I bought it full time, then it went away. Hmm. What yeah. about you, Bob? <laughs> <laughs> what about Bob? What about Bob? I used, I had my domain like a long, long time ago. I bought it for a dollar. This is back like in 1999. Ooh, and, uh, and, and I didn't even know that you, you know, you had to maintain the license on it. <laughs> and, uh, so, you know, like a couple of years later, I'm trying to use my own name as a domain and, you know, I'm, and I can't. So I do all this research and everything like that and find out some guy has it. And so his name I, Bob. No, <laughs> <laughs> he, had, he had a bunch. He had a bunch of them, you know, and then so I, I you know, I, I, I found out who he was and, you know, they had a thing where, you know, if you want to, you know, contact this owner and see if they'll sell it. So I went through the whole email form and everything like that. And he come back and said it was, you know, like a thousand dollars. And I was like, dude, it's me. That's me. <laughs> like that's my name, dude. Yeah. And he goes, You should have bought it, you know? And uh and then so but I I kept checking it. Every year I would check it. And then eventually, you know, I checked it one year and it and it was available and I bought it right then and there and I've maintained it ever since. Wow. Cause you ain't getting my name. Sounds Powerful like story. Yeah. It was a very emotional story. Yeah, yeah, I think <laughs> so. Well, let's move away from domains and back to lost films. And, I mean, in terms of the lineup, it really is quite diverse, not just in terms of the demographic, but the experience. So you have authors like... Brian Evanson and Gemma Files, but then you've got Dustin Katz, who I believe this is his first paid publication, and then you've got two of This Is Horrors, Kev Harrison and Thomas Joyce, who are also just starting to get their work out there. And also Bob. Yeah, but like, I mean, well... <laughs> Bob. <laughs> Bob. <laughs> no, I mean... Well, I, I, I don't care. <laughs> Bob's not like a newbie, though. So no, I yeah, mean, yeah. I mean, that was the <laughs> point. What he's to that say. was oh, the point. Okay. That was the point I was trying to make. And then it's like, Max, am I meant to <laughs> respond to that? I don't know. I well, when you said like they were associated with the website, that's what that's where my mind went. That's okay. Yeah, <laughs> I think I think this might actually be. Is this Thomas Joyce's first sale? No, no second, I think. Second, but still. Still, I mean, that's that's good. Yeah, I mean, um, he submitted to us in the past, and right. I don't know if we should say this, but I'm, we rejected him a few times in the past. So I was really happy to to see how he's improved over the time. Yeah, and, well, I know he made the shortlist one time for Dark Moon, and I, yeah. I felt so bad rejecting him because it, it was, was it was good. a decent yeah. story, but it just wasn't strong enough for the time. Uh, Thomas, he was really the Tillman, like he. Uh, he submitted to us and then a few weeks passed and he emailed us desperately asking to 
resubmit because he had rewritten it again. And we were like, yeah. And that's what he did. And yeah, we ended up accepting it. And what you said about Dustin Katz, that's true. He's never had anything uh, sold before fiction wise. And I was surprised because his submission was fucking great. Mm -hmm. It's about uh, these group of YouTubers who go around like skilling people and then selling the videos. Man. Like a prank YouTube show. Yeah, that sounds like trippy as fuck. That sounds like a kind of Cronenberg style story. Mm. Almost. But no, his name is Dustin. <laughs> uh, there you go. <laughs> Cats. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think so, is go on, Max? I had nothing to say. I was drinking coffee. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. This is going to be a pain in the ass at it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I'm thinking the whole like, I bought a domain name <laughs> tangent <laughs> might go as an outtake because, like, as not fun the most as, exciting. As fun as that is for me to talk about, you know, I would <laughs> like people to listen to this and think, you know what, I want to buy lost films and not <laughs> think, you know, I want to buy a really shitty domain name. <laughs> Why not do both? You can. You can. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely an outtake. You don't want to get people away from this to suddenly go to, you know, GoDaddy. <laughs> The with their with their crazy names. If you lost domain names, then you can bring it back up. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. That was, that That's was what sad. I suggested. Lost links. <laughs> lost links. Yeah. Lost links. But that could stand for like sausages too. <laughs> oh, I know. John Foster's all over it already. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Speaking of John, he's also in this book. Yes. He's just a great writer all the way around. I don't think I've ever read anything by him. I've gone, man, what the hell are you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Sometimes you read stories by people and you're like, that just sucked. We published John and uh, his debut novel is Dead Men. When did that come out? Like two years ago. Uh, I think it's been like three or four. Well, I don't think it's been that long. Anyway, his submission in Lost Films is his classic blend of like uh, noir and crime right. and also uh, Hill fiction. It's about this man... I can't think of his name now. Archibald Leach. Yeah, that well, whatever that means. It's his name. <laughs> it's his name. You asked what his name that's, was. <laughs> that's some name. But he's like this. Like it seems like he would be featured in other like stories or novels that he's written. Like it, he's so developed. He's basically like this agent who people the government contracts to go do like spooky missions. He's like a fucked up. Uh, Shaggy, I guess. And he gets called out to go investigate this strange, like, Viltex in this town that's telling everything to shit. And I guess I can't say much more without spoiling what's going on, but if you keep in mind the Lost Films theme, it will come as no shock. Connect. Yes. I mean, one thing that I wanted to ask, kind of going along the theme of Lost Films was, you know, are there any kind of strange, like, found footage or bizarre clips that you found on the internet that were kind of just unexplained, and how did you react to them? Because I know when you announced Lost Films, I started, like, looking at all these bizarre things on YouTube because I was originally planning to submit a short story to Lost Film, so I was looking for Inspirado, as Jessica McHugh would say, and there are some fucking strange things out there. The answer I have is no. No, I, I, I haven't looked either. I haven't had time to do anything, but oh. I know there's oh. stuff... Don't, don't owe me. But I know there's stuff that does exist out there that it's like, what the hell? You know, I'm sure I have, but trying to think now, and nothing comes to mind... Um, one fucked up video that does come to mind, not really lost, right. would be the suicide video of Bud Weil. Oh, the, oh. Um, 
<laughs> oh, no. <laughs> are you excited? Mm-hmm. Bob, do you have anything you want to say about that video? I had to watch it again. Oh, why was that? Well, because it's it's kind of like the centerpiece of my of my story of lost films, and it got it to be on a track, which is not about an a track. <laughs> it's about a VHS tape. <clears throat> yeah. But uh, yeah, the the Bud Dreyer thing that's that's one of those films that stuck with me because you know the the actual VHS tape which I, no one has anymore it's probably destroyed by now uh, was an actual real tape and it had you know Inagata Davida on a track written on the side of it and it was just a basically it was one of those eight hour compilation tapes and it had a bunch of concerts on it some documentary stuff like that a lot of just weird stuff. And at the end of it, it has Bud's uh, speech and where he, uh, you know, kills himself in, in front of a live studio audience. <laughs> and uh, not really, but yeah, I was at a press conference and they filmed it. And, uh, you know, it it's a rough one. And people say, well, it's just, you know, it's a lot of blood and things like that. You need to watch the whole thing because it, it will really, it, it'll destroy you. <clears throat> Yeah, um, like he hold he goes through this long speech, right? And then he pulls out a Manila envelope. He in the envelope is a gun. He brings out the gun, and everybody in the room just fucking panics. And he says something like, "If this will affect you, please leave." And then he kabloom, kablam, mm. kaplow. He's dead. It's really disturbing. Uh, that song, uh, "Hey Man, Nice Shot." That's what the song's about. Mm-hmm. Although a lot of people think it's about uh, the Colt Cobain, they all wrong. Right, that's a that's a big misconception about what Filter, you know, did with the Hey Man, I nice Shot. They were not talking about Kurt Cobain. They were talking about Bud Dreyer, and uh, you know, it's uh, that's almost kind of you know instrumental too, but it's a. Uh, it's just a I mean it's 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 something that just it, that's stuck with me. I know it stuck with you, Max. I mean, it's just you know, uh, I remember reading your your uh, your intro to Lost Signals, and I had no idea how that that actually affected you. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So in the intro, I talk about this, but we can also talk about this now. When I was a kid, uh, how many of you have seen the Faces of Death movies? I knew oh, they yeah, were out there. Sorry. I mean, I remember seeing the videos, but I don't, can't say I've ever watched any of the actual. Do those make it to the UK, Michael? I have not seen them, no. Do you know what I'm talking about? I'm not sure I do. Like, so tell me. <laughs> they, they were a series of movies that will advertise as real um, scenes of death and mayhem. So, like, it would just be a clip show of suicides and shootings and just the most fucked up graphic shit you can imagine. Yeah, that, like, I, I'm looking, like, Googling it now. Like, we have spoke about this on the podcast before. Who was that with, Bob? I don't remember. Because <laughs> neither do I. That's why I'm What's putting you on the with spot. With me? Uh, I, know, I know we talked about it before. It's, um... Yeah, we growing up in the '80s, you know, and when the the VHS era, those were like the films that you know, if you're if you were a teenager and you went to the video store, you immediately went to the horror section, and you were in the F's going faces, 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 and if the place and if the place did not have any videos of faces of death, you were like, okay, this place is terrible. <laughs> You know, I'm not even going to rent a movie here. Yeah. You know, and then you would, you'd, so you would go, and even if you had seen it, you, that was how you knew that they were actually ordering good movies, you know, and you could, you could, you could find, you know, a lot of the, the stuff that was just really, really good that, you know, at, at the time it's like, you know, I, I'm bringing home like, you know, reanimator and stuff like that. My dad's like, these are terrible, you know, and I'm like, they're great, you know, and the <laughs> face is the death. And my dad's like going, that, this isn't real. Then, you know, five minutes later, he's going, that looked like it was real. Where the deal? You know, is so, that how he sounded? <laughs> not really, but, you know, I mean, I'm just trying to, to, to change, you know, 
Gotcha. Kind of have that kind of, well, this isn't, you know, you know what I mean. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> so. <laughs> I mean, my dad, my dad sounded like me. So. Was he a cartoon you know, <laughs> <laughs> No. Yeah. Uh, like, they will advertise as real, but later, like, we would find out that no, most of the death scenes will stage by a cast and crew. And in retrospect, a lot of it's pretty obvious now. But when I was a kid, like 10, 11, I really wanted to see it. I don't know why. I guess every kid wants to see that movie. So I got my mom to let me rent it, even though I don't think she knew what I was getting (laughs) from a Hollywood video. So we get that movie, and I go home, I watch it in my room alone. And it's inside this movie there's such fucked up shit and it. it left me so nauseated and feeling and at the, that the at the end of the movie is the whole like speech of bud's wild suicide and just something about that man it haunted me like so long and i forgot about it then like later on i forgot all about it until i read bob's submission and it's like holy shit yeah i saw that dude shoot himself in the face so when I went to write this intro, I wanted to look up Faces of Death and talk about it a bit. I couldn't find any instance of this suicide video being in any of the... Not in Faces of Death, not in any of the sequels. It did not exist. So I'm thinking, well, how the hell did I see this movie? Turns out, all this time, I thought I've seen Faces of Death. I was wrong. They made a spin-off movie, this secondhand cheap piece of shit called traces of death and in this movie everything was legit nothing was staged so all this time i have been correctly just traumatized by a fucking snuff film that for some reason was available to rent at hollywood video oh man yeah (laughs) i'm looking at this now so yeah this this is this is not a film. This is stock footage depicting death yeah. and real scenes of violence. <laughs> so I can imagine you mentioning it to people and they're like, oh, you realize that faces of death, you know, that, that's fake. Don't worry about it. And then yeah, later it's like, you, you know, that fake film. Yeah. You didn't watch that one. You watched the real <laughs> shit. <laughs> I mean, it was a classic case of the Mandela effect. Right, right. Which, yeah, also, which also ties into lost films quite heavily. Now, I, I mean, you all know what the Mandela effect is, right? Yeah. Right, yeah. It, uh, it was, the, the name was, uh, it was coined the Mandela effect because everybody thought he had died, uh, Nelson Mandela had died a long ass time ago. So when he died again, they were like, hey, isn't he already dead? No second scoops, you know? <laughs> <laughs> that is exactly what they said. It was, Just exactly like it that. It was yeah. a headline yeah. of BuzzFeed, I think. Uh, I mean, other little classic Mandela effects. Well, the, uh, the Bill Stain, Bill Stain builds. Everyone thought it was spelled S-T-A-I-N. It's S-T-E-I-N-N. Yeah, they yeah. were Jewish, it turns out. Shazam! So, yeah, Shazam, yeah. which I am a victim of this one. I also <laughs> thought when I was a kid, I used to watch this movie with uh, Sinbad as a genie. It wasn't, wasn't it Shaquille O'Neal? <laughs> yeah. Right, it was Kazam with Shaquille in, O'Neal. But... In, this uh-huh. new, in this new reality, yeah, but in a different one, the one I grew up in, <laughs> it was Shazam with Sinbad. Um, what else about other ones I'm trying to think of now? You're uh, putting me on the spot, so I'm like, I don't know. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. I before we got on this podcast, I read up on, on a bunch of them so we could talk about them. But now I'm blanking on them all. Maybe I didn't read about them after all. That could I mean, also yeah. be on Mandela. <laughs> yeah, thought you did. Anyway, it ties into lost films because at the end of the book, there is a novella like sixteen thousand words long by David James Keaton, and it is easily the best thing Keaton's ever written. I mean, this thing was destined. It was re- it was destined for him to submit to because he's a huge fucking movie fan. All he does is talk about movies, and bam, fucking lost films. So he writes this long novella about. I'm not gonna. Tr- I'm trying not to spoil too much of it, but it's about about this VCR 
that after you put in a tape and you rewind it, it rewrites the ending. So the idea is what happens if you put in a movie based off a true event, like the Titanic? So they it's like does it mean does that mean in real life the Titanic never sinks? So there's a lot of like false and memory themes going throughout that novella. So I was able to tie it in to the intro by mentioning the Mandela effect affecting me with faces, traces of death. Yeah, and what hmm. uh, what an amazing concept from Keaton right there. I mean, the, the possibilities. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, see, I knew I knew he had a story in there, and I have, but I haven't read it yet. But I mean, I like this. Wow, I'm gonna read that tonight. <laughs> I mean, I don't like to say like, oh, this is the best one of the book, but that's the best entry of the whole anthology. Sorry, Bob. Someone's always gonna be better than me. Well, not always. I mean, you were the best one in Mojo Rising. Yeah, I'd second that. Oh, yeah. that was no, no one else. Story. No one else in that book. <laughs> <laughs> I do the best by myself. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you know what? That's a great novella. You should be proud of it. I am proud of it. Well, no, but sound- I mean, I'm. I'm always amazed. I'm. I'm like. I'm totally blown away that I'm in. Uh, that I'm in an anthology with Brian Evanson and Gemma Files. And and you know and Foster who I've never been in and Christy Demeester and Izzy Lee I mean it's just like and there's so many names and I'm just like ah I can't believe I did this I can't believe it I'm just like I'm not even worthy I'm just so ooh. but yeah this is <laughs> I'm just, I mean I I'm feel the same way to be editing this book man I mean I've never published Brian or Gemma before I'm amazed that it's happening and it's yeah. funny with. Gemma, because she also has a new novella in it, original, never been reprinted. Mm-hmm. Because I had reached out to Gemma, I was like, "Hey, the the best uh, thing I've ever read was by you, and that's called Each Thing Is a Piece of My Death." Oh yeah, and I think it's, I think it's oh, full yeah. for this book, and I would love to reprint it. And she responded by sending me this new novella that was like almost finished, and she said, "Well, what about this instead?" <laughs> I read it. It's like, oh uh, yeah, this also fits the theme, and it's also great. Let's do this. So I don't know if she was writing it to submit to my anthology, or she just happened to be writing a new novella about lost films. But it matched. Yeah, the thing with Gemma is almost like David James Keaton. She, you know, she used to be a film critic and everything. Yeah. And, and so, I mean, in film is obviously with the experimental film. I mean, she. That, that's that's like a big part of, of what she does. And, you know, you, you have people that say, oh, yeah, but you need you, you need to read night film, which I haven't read and everything. And it's like, no, there, there's there's more to it than just that, you know. Uh, and I think yeah. that she she's probably one of the, the, the front runners of, you know, the lost the lost film thing. Definitely. Yeah. And. Yeah, Brian, I'm not going to say anything about his submission because it's not too long. But, I mean, it's classic Edmondson in this. He has that trippy, uh, like, uneasy approach to reality that makes you question everything. That, like, I don't know, like, when you read Brian Edmondson, you suddenly become convinced that, like, your flesh is a couple inches away from your bones. It's like everything feels wrong. Yeah, that's that's... That's a good good app way of describing his work. Yeah. Uh, who else? Uh, Betty Rock studies in this, and the cool thing about Hill submission is she has drawn a flip book that goes at the end of the little story. So, like, as it goes on, there's this crazy fucking flip book that begins just like distilling the pages. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Is that something that's only available in the physical edition? <laughs> yeah. Well, the pictures are in the ebook edition, but the, you can't really flip through them, so it I guess kinda it doesn't have the same a, effect. A, a yeah. Cat book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you, what you you did try to put it in the electronic they, they are, edition yeah, too. Yeah, they are in the ebook. I just and I try to put them about the same place they were in the print book. 
but you yeah. know, electronic never equates the same. So yeah, yeah it probably looks kind of it kind of looks kind of funky, but like I mean, Whatever, still know? cool drawings of these elephants. Okay. So. I mean, elephants are all not elephants. They're not elephants. My bad. Uh, yeah. Any find any little thoughts you me about lost films? You should go buy it. <laughs> No, I think we have a good um, smattering of not only films, but webcam films, drawings. Yeah, VCRs. Luke, Luke Spoonel did illustrations. Yeah. Once again, like he did for Lost Signals, and they all just... Security amazing. cameras. I mean, there's just a... Well, one of the stories revolves around uh. a security camera. <laughs> I'm just saying that they're not all just about actual film films. One more uh, story I do want to talk about is uh, Andrew Novak's story. It's called This Cosmic Atrocity. I think it was the first one I accepted, right? I think so. I, like, usually when I do an anthology, when we do an anthology, we sh- we don't accept anything until the end. Like, we just make different groups. Like, okay, this is going to have a good chance of coming right, in. This but this one, as soon as I read it, I emailed him back and said, uh, please sign this contract. It is about this boy he's like 10 i guess around there yeah and he keeps seeing crusty the clown from the simpsons on the playground at school and nobody believes him like they all just call him a liar they ground him for telling lies until they take him in to to see how fuck i'm spoiling things again but okay it's about the simpsons that's all i can really tell you crusty the clown and crusty the clown yes I want to, I want to tell you guys everything about it, but I realize I cannot do that. So you, you you all just have to go read it because it's easily the creepiest damn thing I've ever read in my life. I mean, it is crest clown. Yeah, and you reference it in the blurb, and I mean, I'm sure that everyone's in just from reading the Lost series finale of The Simpsons corrupts a young boy's sanity. Like, how can you not want to read that? <laughs> So I read that, and then uh, when Dylan came home from school, that's uh, Lloyd's son, he's a big Simpsons fanatic. I was like, hey, you have to just sit next to me. I'm going to read this to you. And <laughs> he thought it was the coolest thing because yeah. it's the Simpsons. But also he seemed like he was scooting away from me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know if you knew, but because you mentioned Traces of Death earlier, there are, in fact... If you uh, want to see more Traces of Death, four sequels. So I'm not got... surprised. Good lord. Yeah. You've got uh, Traces of Death 2 in 94. 95 followed up with Traces of Death 3. Uh, then you got Traces of Death 4 <laughs> resurrected. Traces of Death 5 back Jesus in Christ. action. <laughs> so, back in action? Yeah. That's that's that... that... <laughs> <laughs> but it's still... <laughs> Uh man, I just I have no interest in seeing these snuff films, man. I, I think the first one I ever saw was JFK getting his brains blown yeah, out. In case you will finally like Yeah, that. the JFK you talking about the Oliver Stone movie? No, just the video. It was on it was on YouTube, the clip. Yeah. Cuz I mean in the Oliver Stone film, that was the first time that the Zapruder film was actually shown in its entirety. Yeah. Uh, before that, I mean, it was like you, you, you pretty much had to, you know, you had to go sign a waiver and go to like, you know, uh, I think they had it at you know, some document storage or something like that. And you had to, from what I heard, no, that may not be true, but you know, you had to sign a waiver and everything that you weren't going to, you know, say what you saw or anything. And then they would show you the film and they'd have, you know, like, you know, you'd have to wait till there was enough people that they'd show it and you'd be like, Oh shit. You know, and then and of course Stone got it. I think he I think he ended up buying the rights directly from Zapruder. So he could put the whole thing in there from the Zapruder family. And uh you know, and, and it was the first time that it was shown and people think, you know, I've talked to some people say, Well no, they they did that for the movie. I'm like, no dude, that's the actual footage. Yeah. You know? And you can't like- you said so you can't tell me that you know, that that what happened, you know, that like, oh, yeah, well, he just got shot. You know, he got shot in the head. I'm like, no, he got the top of his head blown off. When did when did JFK come out? 
Uh, that was in the nineties. Late eighties. Okay. I want to say it was yeah. late eighties because it was before I left home. So I mean, this is interesting, okay? Because like this is where we um, differ because YouTube it came out like two thousand five, right? Um, I was twelve. That that clip was like uploaded to YouTube immediately. So like at age twelve, myself, my friends, we already seen like the whole clip, like. That's where like things all well, different between you and I because you had to wait and whatnot. But like my generation, will uh, we will subject it to, to these types of videos from a, like immediately. And I I remember at the same age going to like Rotten dot com with my friends. Do you guys remember oh, yeah. that website? Oh yeah, it was I'm just a website of, oh, yeah. image, of images and videos of. <laughs> dead bodies i guess well and i'm sure that's why like faces of death and even traces of death were so popular at like blockbuster and stuff because that was the only place you could get anything like that because yeah you there was no such thing as the internet where you could go search for stuff i mean i'm sure that's the only reason those movies had gained the notoriety that they have yeah i mean rolled in mouth like oh my god did you did you heal about that but how cool are you have you rented faces of death yet you know but now we just like do a a, 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 a gif and, yeah. and a comment. It's like the same thing. Like, have you seen this this right. YouTube clip? Right. Yeah, I guess it is a lot different because you had so much so so much accessibility to it. Yeah. Whereas right. my generation didn't, you know, and we didn't even know. I had to find out about the Zapruder film, you know, after I saw Jay. I knew about it, but I didn't know it was in the movie. And so I and I saw JFK in the theater. Me and a group of friends went and seen it, and uh, and I think the movie's so long. I'm pretty sure I remember correctly. They actually have an intermission, and uh, so you got yeah. You know, that's you, what I was telling Max the other day. I'm pretty sure that was like one of the last films to have an intermission in the middle of it, so people could go pee. <laughs> funny right, enough, yeah. funny enough, we were talking about this movie not too long yeah. ago because it's on Filmstruck, which is a website I really much. Encourage anyone who's interested, like in classic films, to subscribe to. Uh, it was recently added to Filmstruck, the director's mm -hmm. cut. It's like almost full hours long. And, like I want to yeah. watch it. We both do, but it's like who the fuck has that time? I don't you know. shouldn't watch it because you, when you when I when I saw that theater, I, I think our the cut we saw was three hours long. Mm. And when when the movie was over, it's one of those films that when we walked out of the theater. And it was actually a very crowded time, viewing time. No one was talking. People nice. looked shell-shocked. Yeah. And it was just, you know, I, and, and I know I was just, I was, I, I mean, I was, I was like, I couldn't even believe what I just saw. I was just like, oh, my God. You know, and then you, you, you think, okay, this, this is a movie. And then you, you start researching, you know, of course, you you can fall down pretty deep in the rabbit hole with that stuff, but you know it's a it's a harrowing film. It's to me, it's probably one of Oliver Stone's best films. That and and probably the hand. But I think I mean what Max was saying about like deaths being immediately available. I mean absolutely right i mean when saddam hussein was executed in 2006 i remember that the video was then available on the internet within hours they right. practically live streamed yeah, it. yeah they did yeah they did oh shit do you think that's gonna happen someday like just live streaming executions i'm sure you could probably find it now if you search for oh. it Oh yeah, I'd imagine. Like in like in like in prisons. No, I'm I mean. sure you could find it if you knew. I mean, I'm sure it's available. <laughs> Do you think someone's bootlegging them, like with a camcorder, just I, doing a live stream? I imagine, I yeah, on the dark net. I'm sure you know if you've got a tour browser, you can find all of that pretty easily. I right. have a feeling that probably every legal execution in, done in a prison is probably filmed at this point. I'm sure it has to be filmed, yeah. Well, I, I, I don't, I'm not saying yeah. that. I'm saying live stream. No, I'm, sure if, you know, I, I, I'm yeah. sure if you can figure out how to hack into it, you could probably get it. Like, I'm like I'm waiting for the day that, like, the Facebook accounts of prisons just begin 
live streaming Facebook there. Live just, no, yeah, what happened? Happen. Yeah, I did wonder if you were going there because I mean, there's such a kind of fascination with this kind of thing. You know, when uh, the BBC gonna be like, right, we've got the rights for our new <laughs> hilarious <laughs> series where we live stream executions. I mean, I would probably tune in. <laughs> God. Oh my god. I mean, I think when, when I saw the Saddam Hussein execution, so like, I guess I must have been 20, and then like, you know, I, I was quite, I guess I was quite excited, like, oh, let's, let's see this, and then when I did, I thought, oh, oh that was... That's quite unpleasant. Like, I don't feel so good. I mean, I don't know what the fuck I expected. Yeah, like, well, I'm wondering, way. like, if they started live streaming, like, executions and, and, and lethal injections and stuff, how many people would change their mind about the death penalty? I don't know. Would anybody? I, I mean, I don't know. I'm wondering if so. I mean, that's how I felt with that Traces of Death movie. Yeah. I was excited. My brother had been talking to me about that thing for ages. Of course, I got the wrong movie, but... Right. <laughs> It fucked me up. I was like, this is not what I wanted to see. No. But yeah, I mean, would that result with a ban on uh, capital... Capital punishment? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. I mean, like, like you say, it might lead to some people changing their mind. To be honest, like, I think it would go two ways you'd have some people who would find it pretty sobering and you know they'd be more against it and you probably have more people that would you know be happy about it and be like yeah this is what we need to see we need to see more of this we need to see people punished for what they've done whereas i mean i know that bob and i have spoken about this numerous times on the podcast and in Patreon episodes as well. I mean, for me, like, it's always got to be rehabilitation where possible. And we were saying with Jonathan Jans, it does become problematic when you've got a sociopath, when you've got someone who neurologically, you know, they, they, they're kind of incapable of a moral compass, someone who rehabilitation wouldn't work on them. So then what on earth do you do but then if you say well then you execute them it's like well how much no. better right, than no. them are you if that's what you decide to do yeah I mean, what gives the government the right to kill somebody exactly yeah. i mean if you think about it if, let's say that like ted bundy was happening like instead of happening in the late 70s or 80s was happening right now and there's no doubt in my mind with the if you had the same notoriety as that case had and the same drama, you know, that he fired his attorney. He went and, and damn near won his own case and eventually got sentenced to death. And his years on death row, there's no doubt in my mind that his execution would probably be the one that they would televise. Could just, be. Because, just because right, of, the of the notoriety. Right, because of the notoriety, yeah. Right. Yeah, you know? I, mm. definitely. They would at least, at least live tweet it, like, oh, now he's shaking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Hashtag fried. I mean, <laughs> but, I mean, like, like I wouldn't even agree with him being executed. I mean, I just, no. I'm definitely against it. it just it was all, uh, yeah. I mean, what, what? Just take a take a note from John Carpenter. Okay, we're talking about lost films. John Carpenter, he's the king, right? Absolutely. Oh, fuck, yeah. what's that movie called? <laughs> that one. Uh, Escape from New York. Just do that. Take a fucking city, block it off, throw the socios, sociopaths in there, let them hash it out. And then go. eventually send Kurt Russell in to <laughs> save To somebody. save the day. <laughs> no I like that. that movie. Oh. oh, I've seen it. I love it. It's one of my favorites. <clears throat> have you seen it, Michael? I have, yeah. I was, I was just thinking how to respond to what you just said and i don't well you obviously didn't mean it as a serious suggestion so i don't need to i don't need to pick apart no. the flaws no, I, just, I was trying to swing this back the films and yeah exactly. thank you you did i did i'm so proud well actually on that note one of roger venable's 
Patreon questions is about Lost Films, and he says, when ordering the stories for Lost Films, did you start out with any guiding principles, or did the order develop organically after reading and selecting the stories? I believe I was the one who, yeah, picked, you, who you, decided. You decided, yeah. yeah. Okay, so um, I wanted to... I knew I was going to end it with David Keaton's because a it was the longest, and just the way the novella ends, it just so there's no possible way to follow it up. It just seemed like, well, yeah, this is obviously the end of everything. But to begin with, I always like to begin a a collection with something not too long because my mindset is someone might pick it up. They'll, they'll think, okay, I'll just give this a few pages. And they have enough time to get through a whole story, and then they're like, okay, yeah, let's see what else this book's got. And uh, the way... I try to link them all together like it's a puzzle. Like I try to have the themes kind of connect. Like, for instance, uh, Jessica McHugh's and Christy the Measles. Both of them... Both of those stories take place in the woods, and they have similar... Like a mood to it, yeah. So I, I liked how those kind of lined up. Um, okay, yeah. Lee Holland has a story about this the student who makes a film, and in the in the film at the end of the the, the student film, the uh, protagonist they open the door to go into this room, and every at the end you never get to see what's in the room. And everyone's like, they become obsessed. Like, what the fuck's in the room? So immediately after uh, Lee's story is Dusting Cats, which is called The Thing in the Side Room. And it's about these spooky uh, props, like, hiding in the room. So I thought that was a cool connection. So, like, when I'm doing these anthologies, I just try to find connections and I piece them together. Like, I'm just doing a jigsaw puzzle, I guess, would be my answer. Yeah, and do you have a... Take consideration for word count and, you know, maybe put in a longer story next to a shorter story. Does that factor in at all? It does, yeah. I don't like having, like, two 7,000 ruled stories together. If I have something that's quite lengthy, I like to follow it up with something that's, like, two or 3,000 ruled long to give the the audience a breathal, a chance to, like, oh, just to sit back and get something short out of the way. Right, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Bob, do you have anything you want to add to that? Or a no, I, I always find it's it's fascinating because you know you you've got all these these stories here and you, and you want to have a cohesive flow, and so to me, if I was editing an anthology, not just oh, not only picking the stories but doing the order thing, that would probably be the most frustrating thing for me. You know, I'd be I like the guy it. who's that who's who's like it, it. This thing's about to go to print, and I'm on the phone going, no, 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 no. <laughs> I know I thought about this. I had a dream. We have to change the order of these two stories, but then this story needs to be third. (laughs) You know, and they're like, but but you can't do that. Yeah, yeah, I can. Yeah, I can. (laughs) It could be frustrating, man, because like I'll spend a couple days just trying to decide like will these things should go. And if you think about it, half the time, the audience is probably just skipping around and reading them randomly anyway. It's all like just a waste. But I'll tell you that the easiest decision I would say would be be able to put the introduction. And I would, it, I would use that. <laughs> the, table, the table of contents. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The table of contents the can be tricky sometimes. I'm usually we, going yeah. to do, and if I ever edit an anthology just to blow this thing apart, I'm going to put the introduction at the end of the book. That's, it's called an after book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, 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 but it's going to be called, it's going to be called a forward introduction. Yeah, good luck selling that book. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna make sure that. It, it, in other words, I want people to actually go. Look, man, they fucked up. And put the introduction at the end, <laughs> and I'm gonna even say this is at the end on purpose. Thanks, Max. <laughs> I can confirm that the Sahara will not be publishing that particular anthology. You oh, say that okay. now. You say that now. <laughs> You'll yeah. change your mind. It's not happening. No, you won't. It's not <laughs> happening, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to know. kill me and inherit the Sahara, and people have heard that now. So if I die, and you put that <sighs> out, 
Yeah, that, that's fine. That's yeah. fine. <laughs> I, know, got... I know for me, when I put together Dark Moon Digest, that's my favorite part is figuring out the order. And mm -hmm. I think it relates to my dance experience of putting together recitals. You know, I got to have a ballet number, then a tap number, then a jazz number. I can't have two jazz numbers together. I've got, you know, yeah, I mean... these kids are in this number, so they can't be in the next number. It's kind of like a shuffle. And to me, that's the way anthologies work. That I got to shuffle sense. them together. You teach, you've taught dance a while. A long now. time. I mean, it makes sense that it would. You've got to start ways. with a, you know, a bang, and you got to end with a bang, and you know, the middle has to be a bang to keep the audience interested. Are you saying bang because you just downloaded that bang bang? Bang song? bang. <laughs> no, I'm oh, okay. using it as a show biz term. Downloaded what? What are we talking about here? He <laughs> <laughs> made me download a song called Bang Bang for possibly using my jazz three class this next year. Ah. Keep up, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you should know that. <laughs> I sent you these notes last night. <laughs> I know, I know. Appalling. <laughs> <laughs> but what about all of you as readers? Do you read anthologies and magazines in the order they're presented? If I was going to, if I had time to read one, yeah, I typically do read in order. Just no, I, I don't. Max doesn't. So I'm, a, I'm a hypocrite because I don't. I'll just, I'll go to the names I know and then yeah. I'll go back. I mean, that's not the way I want anyone to read my anthologies, but when I do read an anthology, I'll just skip around. I'm a piece of shit, and I know it. Is that part of why you put Brian Evanson as the first story? Because he's perhaps the biggest name in the anthology, and you thought, well, if I was reading it, that's the one I'd start with anyway. Honestly, no. Um, I don't want to say too much about his submission, but... Out of all of them, it perfectly contains the Lost Films theme. Like, really, um, what's the role uh, yeah, I'm thinking of? I, I know what you're saying, but I just can't think of what you're Like, a lot, a lot of the stories, they take the, the idea of Lost Films and they kind of branch out to loose ideas of how mm. it can fit. But Brian's is, that's the Lost Film story. yeah. Like if I wanted like a uh, a mascot for what I wanted, Brian did it. Yeah, and, and plus it's not too long, so that also helps to me. No, as soon as he read, as soon as he read Brian's story, he's like, "Well, there's our opener." I mean, it wasn't even a question. I mean, that's what he told me. He's like, "I just read the opening to Lost Films," and I was like, "Well, alrighty then." I almost didn't even write an intro because if it could also be an intro, it fits so well. And the way it ends is like, okay, it feels almost to me like the opening of a anthology whole movie. Mm. Yeah. If yeah. That makes sense. And it, there are certain hints as to where that story is going, but it doesn't make the ending any less satisfying. I enjoyed it a great deal. Oh, you read it? Yeah, I did. Well, thank, then, thank there you go. You know what I'm talking about then. Yeah. I can't read it the same anthologies the same way. I, would, I was going to say that I like to read them front to back, you know, beginning to end. But that's not true. I mean, I'm being completely honest. I have jumped around. Uh, so now I, I guess it really kind of depends on on what the, the actual anthology is. You know, <clears throat> like on this one here, I've, I've been jumping around. And now I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm regretting that because I feel like I should have not jumped around. Bob. Great Bob. Oh, no. God damn it. Great Bob. Wait, what's that song? <laughs> Great Bob's of Fire. Great Bob's of Fire. <laughs> Great Bob's of Fire, yes. <laughs> and I mean, I, I don't feel bad about it because I can always, you know, uh, you know, start all over and, you know, just skip the ones I've already read. Uh, but then, you know, but uh, it's just... It's really, it all depends on the anthology, I guess, you know, I, yeah, but yeah. I will agree originally you. I was like, oh yeah, I like to read them front to back, you know, because I want to see a cohesive theme and, but that's not, I mean, that's not true. That's, that's just not a true statement. It sounds really good, but that's not a true statement on how I do it. Kind of more random. Mm. I guess there's more benefit reading a themed anthology in order, but if there's no theme at all, then, you know, yeah. just kind of pick and choose as you will. So I guess in that, since it's similar to music albums if you've got a concept album you're probably going to want to listen to that in the order that it's put together but 
if not, then you might as well just jump from track to track. I mean, I do the same thing with novels. I'll just skip <laughs> randomly throughout. <laughs> I don't give a shit. <laughs> if it doesn't make sense, then they uh, they failed as a as a novelist. Of course. Yeah. So, you know, for those taking <laughs> notes, write that down, put that on your noteboard. If if your stories don't make sense in any order, then you have, in fact, failed. I mean, if Chuck Palahniuk can do it with his remixes, anyone oh should God. be able to do it. There you go. His regular novels are like that. What are you talking about? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I think he does just like, okay, time to scramble these. <laughs> Let's throw these chapters up in the air. Whatever way they land is the way they're going in the book. <laughs> That's how he sounds, too. It is, too. He sounds like a Willy Wonka kill. <laughs> sounds quite okay. similar to Bob's dad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God, Bob. You yeah. didn't tell me. What? <laughs> Bob Politic? <laughs> <laughs> it all makes sense. <laughs> Robert Polinick. <laughs> uh, Robert Polinick, yes. Um, His name was Robert Paulson. <laughs> <laughs> Goodness gracious, great pops of fire. <laughs> That's, well, that should be the... Would that should be the... Worst. I'm spending the weekend with these two. I know. <laughs> and I'm going to have this great bobs of fire thing. I'm going to make you a sign. <laughs> I'm being I'm being 100 percent serious, but if you ever have a collection out, Bob, you have to call it "Goodness Gracious Great Bob's File." I everybody will buy it. <laughs> You're like, what the hell is this? That's like what um, Nick Mamatas did with his collection, the Necronomicon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm, you should do it, Bob. Do it. Do it. <laughs> I don't know about all that. <laughs> or, or you could call it. You could call it. What about me? <laughs> what about that, me? Joke, that was lovely. Thank you. <laughs> Have we answered the question? <laughs> yeah, we did. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to part one of our conversation with Max Booth III and Laurie Michelle. Join us again next time for the second of this three-part interview. But, of course, if you want to listen to part two right now, you can do so over at www.patreon.com forward slash this is horror. For one dollar, you get early bird access to every episode, including part two of this conversation, which you can listen to right now. Of course, if you're a patron at the four dollar level, then you get to hear the full conversation ahead of the crowd. So by all means, become our patron at four dollars and you're going to get access to all of this. And since I'm talking about the patreon levels we've really tried to simplify it so you know exactly what you're getting at each level so another few levels that i wanted to draw to your attention are the three dollar level where you get story unboxed a horror podcast on the craft of writing so that's a whole other podcast it has been described as a relaxed literature class like a relaxed mfa seminar So if you want to hear that, of course, you can listen to the previews first on the This Is Horror podcast on this very feed. And if you like it, then do consider becoming a patron for just $3. Now at the $5 level, we are going to be running regular giveaways. And to kick that off, we have got quite the giveaway for you. Everyone at $5 is automatically enrolled in the giveaway. And this weekend, we are going to be drawing a couple of names who will get some free advertising on the This Is Horror podcast, this very podcast in which you are listening to. So, pretty substantial prize. So, if you want to be considered for that, then do become a patron at $5. 
obviously don't just become a patron to be in a prize draw. I mean, there's a lot more than that available. Now, $10, this is our brand new feature. We've got on camera, off record. And what I'm about to tell you does relate to Max Booster Third, because if we can hit $500 this week, then we will do a special on camera off record with Max Booth the third. And I'm hoping that we can. We're very close to $500. I'm saying either $500 or 140 patrons, whichever we get to first. I will record a special on camera off record with Max Booth third. And myself and Bob Pastorella have already recorded three episodes of On Camera Off Record because we record them after every single podcast conversation. It is a video cast. It is a more relaxed and informal format and really anything is on the table in terms of these discussions. I mean, last episode we talked about collaborative writing and we spoke about the next project that myself and Bob Pastorella are looking to work on together. So that was a fun and exciting chat. We also answered a question that Jennifer Grindstaff had, which was asking about the magazines that we would recommend now that Gamut magazine is defunct and has left a hole in her heart, in many of our hearts, I'm sure. It's a fantastic magazine. So if you want the answer to that, become our patron at the $10 level. And this is the best way that you can support the podcast. This is the best way you can support me. So please, if you like what I'm doing, if you like the podcast, I would appreciate it so, so very much www.patreon.com forward slash this is horror. All right, let's have a quick word from our sponsors and then I will wrap up. Do you like Stephen King? Do you like podcasts of Stephen King? Do you like spooky magazines? Good news. Now you can have a St- Stephen King podcast, Castle Rock Radio. And you can have a spooky magazine, Dark Moon Digest. All you have to do, go to www.patreon.com slash PMM Publishing. Have a scary day. As always, I would like to end with a quote. And this quote comes from Kingsley Amos, and it is about reviews. A bad review may spoil your breakfast, but you shouldn't allow it to spoil your lunch. That is Kingsley Amos. I'll see you in the next episode, but until then, take care of yourself, be good to one another, read horror, keep on writing, and have a great, great day.